Thank you, Rania. I'm Richard Armstrong. I'm the director emeritus of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum and Foundation. And I want to use this opportunity to cite our great gratitude to our friends in DCT for our long work together in making the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi uh, a great leading museum, as I'm sure it will be. And you are invited to watch it rise out of the ground as is happening now next to our sister institution, the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Thank you, team members of DCT. I would also like to acknowledge um, the generosity and the great intelligence behind the organization of this culture summit. I'm amazed at the breadth of ideas, the attendees, and I really feel that Abu Dhabi has become the convener of the world. Thank you, Richard. I'm Alexandra Monroe. I'm senior curator uh, at Large Global Arts at the Salman R. Guggenheim Museum and Foundation and a founding curator of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi Project. Um, this panel was originally conceived by our Guggenheim colleague in New York, Syra Levinson, who is really at the forefront of educators in museums today who are rethinking what museum education can be. Um, and the idea among these thinkers and among leaders like Syra is for a museum to shift the concept of education from a place to tell a single monumental story to a place to share multiple, even discordant stories. From a place of learning from, you know, higher to other, um, to a place of experience, even as we shall see with Li Mingwei and Pascal Martini Taillou, of embodied experience. Some of these other paradigm shifts that we're workshopping both at the Guggenheim in Bilbao, in Venice, and increasingly here, Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, is really also shifting the concept from ways of seeing, a museum as a receptacle of a place, as a journey of ways of seeing, to ways of being. From a sonography of objects in space to a choreographer of performers, ourselves, the journeymen and women in space. Um, from being uh, one in a crowd to being with oneself in a crowd. Uh, I'm also especially interested in the shift that we're going to talk about today, and I'm also very interested in what Donatien Grau at both the Musée d'Orsay and now at the Louvre is thinking about this, but how we can shift this very modernist white cube concept of the museum as a place where you are meant to be quiet and silent to maybe a place of cacophony, a place of sound, um, a place of, uh, of, of anthem making. Uh, these are all new models and approaches that we are thinking about and workshopping uh, at museums, I think, around the world with the primary ideas that we're curator curators are really considering now and mapping out their exhibitions, or in our case, opening a new museum um, in the Global South, is, is what is the cadence of a museum? What are you offering those who come? And what is the metabolism of the experience that you are giving to people? Or multiple metabolisms, different metabolisms, different journeys. We're working from the Frank Lloyd Wright spiral, which as Mariette described earlier, is a very rigid, um, linear experience to the kaleidoscope of Frank Gehry's um, Guggenheim Abu Dhabi space. Maybe we're also finally moving, and Mingwei, you will be speaking about this, from the idea of museums in the 20th century as being very secular spaces, maybe to spaces of um, spiritual intelligence and maybe even sacred encounter. Uh, so we have today ex two extraordinary artists, Li Mingwei and uh, Pascal Martin Taillou, who are really at the forefront of breaking up this linear itinerary of exhibitions to become journeys of other kinds of discovery, including joy, including repose, including play. Uh, uh, and um, each has devised, I think, their own radical practice to interrogate all of the assumptions that we are here today to, to face and wrestle with. 
uh, about what a museum is supposed to be, what it used to be, but really now what it can be. And two, in your cases, slowing down the experience of encountering a work of art that might even be yourselves <laughs> in space, and asking viewers again to pay attention to the embodied experience. Uh, and finally, we're going to look to Donatien to kind of ask, um, why does all this matter? Why does it matter to change the cadence and the metabolism? Why does it matter to have these different temporalities and itineraries in our museums today? Okay, so with that, we're going to uh, turn to Li Mingwei. Thank you, Alexandra, Richard, and my esteemed colleagues. What I'm going to do for you for the next seven or eight minutes is to share a story. I call all my projects stories because they came from somewhere and imbued within me, and the content of the story belongs to you, and you change the story in the way that you see fit. This story is called When Beauty Visits. 2015, my partner and I moved to Paris from New York and Taipei. I was never ever so struck by the beauty of Paris. Being an Aboriginal Taiwanese, born in Taiwan, and then lived in Dominican Republic, San Francisco, New York, New Haven, and Paris, I just thought, this is one of the most amazing places on Earth for me. The things we eat, the things we hear, the things we he, um, touch. Also, back in the 1990s, when I was at graduate school in New Haven, when someone says, your work is beautiful, it really is not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, it's a great chance as an artist, to talk about beauty when I was invited to do a project for the Venice Biennale, 2017. So, let's go with it. Let's go to Venice. Mm -hmm. Most of you have been there already. And in the Giardini is the International Pavilion. Inside there is, you know, there are galleries, also a bibliotheque, and a small garden designed by Carlo Scarpa. Most of you have been to this Carlo Scarpa garden with uh, artworks in there, right? But what stay within me most of the time are how disheveled that garden is. There were cigarette butts and leftover um, sandwich bags, and people sometimes put their feet in the pond, um, and the fish were not very happy about it. So what I did is I, I spent about um, three months to plant the trees and then bring in some goldfish to create a very beautiful and serene environment for just one person at a time to visit. Every day in the morning through the evening for six months, there is a garden host walking in the gallery, inviting a stranger who's in the gallery by saying, may I bring you to a small garden? So here is a willing participant coming into the Carlos Scarpa garden, and then the garden house leaves so the person can enjoy the space as the way she wants to and takes her time. Now the, 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 the fish are very happy, I think. <laughs> and then the garden house comes back with a gift. It's an envelope, yeah? Give it to the guest who is sitting in a chair and this is when she says to the guest, the time to open this gift is when you encounter your next moment of beauty. Mm. <laughs> and she leaves. So this person just sits there, looking, enjoying, and takes her time. And then she leaves with this envelope in search of beauty. So that is this young lady's experience of beauty and in the future, right, in her own sense. However, the story continues. Something very surprising happened to me last week. 
when I was installing my show at the Young Museum in San Francisco. I was walking in the gallery. An older gentleman said, "Mr. Lee." I turn around. I say, "Oh, so lovely to see you." He goes, "I know you, but you don't know me." <laughs> so he said, "You did a project called the Living,、uh, the When Beauty Visit, 2017 in Venice." Oh, how beautiful! And I say, "Can you tell me your story, please?" He said, "I was invited into this beautiful garden by a lady." When I sat down, she came in with a, a, an envelope for me, and it says, "When beauty visits." The church bell started tolling in the back. That was when I started crying. I cannot stop crying, and the reason is because exactly the same time yesterday, I scattered my wife's ash into the canal,、mm. and the bell tolled. Mm-hmm. And I cannot believe. Exactly 24 hours later, a young woman invited me to sit here with such grace and beauty and mm-hmm. kindness. Mm-hmm. So I was、mm-hmm. so shocked that this story came back to me.、Mm-hmm. And I say, "Could you please follow me?" I took his hand, brought him to the next gallery, which has my other project called the Mending Project in there. In that gallery, you see a big table with thousands of spool on the wall, and there is a person, a volunteer, sitting behind the table, waiting for anyone to bring something for us to repair. Usually clothing, but sometimes they say it's my heart that needs to be repaired. So I say, "Do you recognize that lady sitting behind the table?" He looked at her for a second and started sobbing. He said. That was the lady seven years ago、oh、that gave me the gift,、God. and this is what happened.、Mm. So I really believe at that very moment, grace and beauty visited every one of us in the gallery, and、um, the story continues.、Mm. So beautiful. Thank you. So beautiful. <clears throat> The magic of ritual really does produce magic. Thank you. So, Richard Armstrong, Director Emeritus of the Salman R. Guggenheim Museum and Foundation. Thank you. <coughs> A long time ago, time in the late 1950s, a young boy visited this museum for the first time without his parents or without classmates, and he previously had been very interested only. In the armor and the horses, but this time he decided to go upstairs to find this, which uh, truly uh, mystified that person who was me around age ten. As you go in, you see that it's a, a accumulation of elegant Chinese artifacts from the past, and I show this to you because I think it's so important for us. In our hyperfluid world, to recognize the value of the museum's fixed assets,、mm-hmm. and that we, as repeat visitors, and I've gone back, of course, dozens of times to this place since it's where I grew up. We, as repeat visitors, are able to measure time against the objects that we're looking at. They almost act as sundials for our own maturation. So, I want to make an argument today for the importance in the museum. Of our, the visitor being able to see things that are relatively fixed, and against which he or her can judge his or her growth. I must argue also that, as a ten-year-old. In contrast, to show you a few slides from the Ankawara exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum about six years ago, where this very unusual Japanese-born, Mexican-raised, New York-centered artist
had a practice of making a painting a day when he was able to, that really fixed time in a very uh, provocative and to some degree impenetrable way. The charm of these paintings ultimately is that you see them in conjunction with a box that protects them and the box is lined with newspaper from wherever they were made. So you can see slightly in the bottom right, he was in New York when he made the painting January 11, 1970, and therefore we see a New York Times image, but the boxes can range all over the world as it was a peripatetic artist. So to my mind, one of the mm -hmm. greatest strengths that artists have is make us focus mm -hmm. and look at things in a very careful way. And I thought this would be an interesting example of that arranged around time. Then finally, let me say that the topic made me concentrate in my own mind about what time could mean. And I realized on this planet, there are only very few givens. One is gravity, mm -hmm. another is death. We have guidelines like longitude and latitude. But time, even though it claims to be scientific, is actually quite subjective infused as it is with, with memory. Mm. And so I say, again, to museum leaders of the future, recognize that art bends mm. time, and mm. it bends time to us, so that we not only understand one another and ourselves better, but that we see that the past has a very deep connection to what we're doing today. Mm. You have one more slide. I do? 1966. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I think that uh, leads us to Dona Tien, who, as many of you know, is the head of contemporary programs um, at the Louvre in Paris, where he is um, in charge of messing up time. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, the objects as they were collected in the scientific, art historical, methodological rules of um, French humanities was indeed, as we heard earlier, by period and by chronology, um, by dynasty. Um, and I think you must have, honestly, the best job in the world because you get to be anachronistic. Um, you get to um, uh, take those categories and, and bend time um, and bend them in concert with the artists you invite to be and live in juxtaposition with these objects from the past. So Donatien, tell us what's on your mind. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you to, uh, thank you to DCT for this extraordinary invitation. Uh, it's my first time at the Cultural Summit. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I'll, I'm very honored uh, by your uh, presentation and I may have you know, one of the greatest jobs. My job is really not to mess up time. Uh, I think it is really to read the music, to help our extraordinary team develop projects with artists and with themselves and to reflect on, uh, on what the museum is. You know, I'm not in charge of contemporary art, I'm in charge of contemporary programs, which means that contemporary, and I will talk about this in a second, is how to be present at one moment and therefore how to engage what there is, which is the legacy. I'll just say one thing and then I'll explain my little methodology for this. Um, I'm especially happy to be here because before working in museums, I was a close friend and collaborator of the late Azedin Alaya, and his greatest project was to do a book called Taking Time, which came out a couple of years ago. And the notion of time and creativity was his greatest obsession. So I spent years in his obsession with time, and here we are today, and I'm especially happy to be here. So just to explain the little methodology of what I will say, um, because we have seven minutes, I mean, I've already used one, <laughs> but I'll just say what we have seven. You've got longer. Uh, okay. But when I was still seven. So I thought, because we have to seize the time, that's the subject of the, of the day, I will make seven arguments in seven minutes. So this, I don't have my phone because I'm rude, <laughs> I just because I'm going to time myself. So first, time as a matter of the museum. The museum as a monument. You know, by definition, time is a matter of the museum in itself. It's collecting objects, keeping objects, presenting objects. So we can say it has to do with the past. You know, it has to do with legacy, it has to do with heritage. And heritage is in itself the encapsulation of time. On the other hand, one could say the absolute opposite. It's about being present. It's about presence. It's about being here and now. 
you know, I, al I always say that being working with contemporary at the Louvre, it's not because we work with contemporary artists. Contemporary arts is something that exists and that can be present in the museum, but every art is contemporary. Yeah. Every day, 30,000 mm -hmm. people enter the door, with the exception of Tuesdays when we're closed, and they experience the art today. Their experience will have probably nothing to do with what people would have experienced 50 years ago. They will connect with it, disconnect from it, relate to it, but it will be today. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty is this entanglement okay. between the absolute present of the presence to the artwork and the immense depth of time. That leads me to my second point, the dream of foreverness. You know, museums are a little bit like love letters that humankind writes to itself. They, when you tell someone you love them, it's forever. Maybe tomorrow you'll change your mind, but it is forever at this very moment. It's the absolute of presence. And it will last, and museums are here to last, because they are these love letters. And that's the beauty of it. Whenever you, something enters a museum, you have the idea that it will be there forever. And museums, as institutions, only have a very short history. You know, MoMA, 100-year-old, Louvre, 230-year-old, that's nothing compared to human history. Mm -hmm. But we have this idea of, of the beauty of foreverness, of something that will be there, that will last, and that mm -hmm. will be in embedded within the greater thing, which is both time and space. And even in US American museums, because we French like to say, we keep things forever, you in the United States, you deaccession all the time. <laughs> uh, actually, things are a little more complicated because <gasps> 99, I mean, you may contradict me if I'm wrong, Alexander or Richard, but 99% of works, you won't really the accession unless you, are, you have a really big problem. True. <laughs> so that idea of foreverness is something that we have to keep in mind. There are these moments when humanity celebrates itself. Third point, museums are extraordinary structures for their own oblivion. I, you know, before working in museum, I was and still am a scholar, and I did a book called Living Museums, which was prompted by afraid from my mentor, Philippe de Montebello, who ran the Met for 31 years. And he said, we in museum forget everything about what has been done before. That's the rule of power, the new people come in, but it's also the history of structures. Museums are so dedicated to the conservation of legacy, of objects, that they don't, self they don't make themselves self-referential. They forget about themselves. And what was extraordinary in this project, going to uh, people like Irina Antonova, or Alan Bonas, or Tom Kranz, or Philippe, or Henri Loiret, you know, all across these people who shaped what museums were, is that their histories are progressively being forgotten. Think about people 30 years before, 50 years before, 100 years before. And one of the things that I always find interesting in museums, that if you look into the methodologies of what has been developed over the past, you will find extraordinary ways of doing things. People have done extraordinary things, but we have forgotten about them, because the mm -hmm. notion of self-reflexivity of the institution, it means that because you are so, we are so present in the museum as is, we forget about what there was. Mm -hmm. Fourth thing, mm -hmm. legacy as contemporary. Mm -hmm. You know, when we experience the past, we experience it today. And that's a total commonplace, but it's also really important to think about it. What does it mean that we're experiencing this legacy today? It means that we can see things that we couldn't see before. Mm -hmm. It means that, for example, you know, a piece of the Louvre, if you, I don't know if, you have, if you've ever seen it, but if you have, it's extraordinary. If you haven't, you should really go see it. We have a small tablet by Enhedwana. Enhedwana was a Sumerian priestess from the 23rd century BC. She wrote poetry. She was the first poet or poetess in history. And here is this tiny object, clay object, that is the first poem by the first woman in recorded history. Mm -hmm. You know, it hasn't been a highlight uh, in visits at the, at the Louvre. People, it's in a corner, it's, but recently, thanks to the great Adonis, who wrote a poem on the Department of Near Antiquities, the Louvre, the spiritual place, it is coming back to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And this is an item today, with our contemporary lens, this Sumerian, this Sumerian tablet from the 16th century BC, mm -hmm. from a text by a poet from the 23rd century BC, is now coming back to mm -hmm. the forefront. Mm -hmm. We read again. And with that, the danger of revisionism. When we read again, we shouldn't, ch we shouldn't change history with our eyes. We should use our lenses to see history again. Mm -hmm. Fifth, time and place. We talked about time, but of course, place is extremely connected to it. 
And I think knowing where you are, knowing your situation, knowing your localization, changes the way you experience what a museum is. You know, we were talking about earlier the sites, you know, Sharjah, Abu Dhabi, Paris, New York. But the truth is, knowing where you are is a way to connect with the other. Mm -hmm. And knowing where you are in similar places. I mean, you, Mingwei, are a great example. You were just talking about, mm -hmm. you know, mo living in Ty between Taipei and New York and moving to Paris. You, Pascal, coming from Cameroon, moving to Paris, teaching at the School of Fine Arts, and now moving to, G to Ghent. So these places can be multiple, but the moment you're aware of the situations, it, is, it changes your entire approach. Mm -hmm. If you think, for example, of the Louvre in Paris, this is at the center of a city that's a multicultural city, that's an intellectual city, that's a popular city, and it is at the center of Europe. If you think of the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, it is two hours away from India, Pakistan, a mm -hmm. couple hours away from Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, connected to the entire world. It's a different st story, it's a different way of telling the story, it's a different mm -hmm. place and that relates to time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sixth element, the Transitory Museum. The idea that museums can move and shift. I wrote a book about this and it, was, it came from a very stupid idea. How can museums and shops be connected or disconnected? You place something somewhere, you bring it somewhere else. Time is the difference between a museum and a shop. It lasts longer, it's kept there. Six element, and then I know I'm about to enter the, my time limit. No, no, it's the okay. Okay, thank you, but <laughs> I'm pacing it. The future of the museum. We're talking about time, let's think about the future. And here mm. I have seven statements. First, the audience. We should never forget that the key to a museum in the, is the audience. In 1923, the great French-American intellectual Henri Faucillon wrote on the 11th century, but basically he was the one who inspired Clement Greenberg to in invent abstract expressionism, talked, said that museum is an encounter between a collection and an audience. There have been many definitions mm -hmm. since, but a collection and an audience. Most important is the audience today, these people coming in today. Mm -hmm. Second, the museum. You know, the definition changes all the time. What a museum is now is not what it was 50 years ago, it was 100 years ago, it was 150 years ago. The museum in Alexandria, mm. the beginning of everything, was actually, and that's perfect for you, a performing arts center mm -hmm. with a library. Mm -hmm. So oh. definitions have changed, they change all the time, but the museum is a place that is open, that integrates many different ways of being and living. Third, conserving. We shouldn't forget that there is a central aspect that we sometimes leave a little aside because of the narrative side of things, that is to keep objects, to protect objects, because they are the world's shared legacy, kept in one place, in one side. Fourth, knowing who one is. Looking at the identity, looking into the past, looking into the many ways a place can be, a museum can be, and opening it up. Because it is through this process of deciphering, of interpreting, that we will be able to know more and actually live in the present. Mm. Then I have fifth, I think, yeah, uh, no, six, um, no, fifth, trying, being experimental. That's the same thing. You conserve, you try, you try things. The good news about the history of museums, and I'm sorry to say that, Richard, everybody forgets 99% of what we've done. So <laughs> what remains is the experience. So we can try. We can try things. From the moment we are embedded, from the moment we are anchored in what we do, we can always keep trying. Six, education and contemplation. Mm -hmm. They do not have to be separate. Yeah. Education, mm -hmm. which is a long process, a research, something we think about, something we develop over time, years and years and years and years, doesn't have to contradict the direct experience. Let it be of a painting, let it be of a Act an actual performance, let it be a video, let it be of a poem. We have to be totally present and embedded within the longer time. Mm. And six, the most important, artists. Artists are not a separate audience. There's not the right. artists, the audience. Yeah. You, you are our first audience. Yeah. And as you are our first audience, you are the bridge between the collection, because you're already there, and the public. And that's what makes your voice so important. Thank you very much. <laughs> Donatien, thank you very much. That was, that was quite a performance um, in time. Um, I just want to follow up with, with one question before turning to, to Pascal. Is, um, could you give us an example um, in your recent work of how any one of those seven principles um, has actually made, been made manifest in the galleries of the Louvre? Well, first of all, it's 
It's not just about the galleries. It's about all the mediums possible. And that's the interesting thing of the present. So I'll just give you three, I'll just give you three different examples. First example, if you go on Instagram, every Friday, we have the great artist Mohamed Bouissa making a video on the Trilby Gardens for an entire year. Every week, a video giving a portrait of the Trilby, the Trilby being this beautiful park in downtown Paris that is part of the property of the Louvre. Second example, a book. We're just publishing a book by the great Adonis that is coming out in French and Arabic at the same time. For us, a very important gesture to show the openness, um, the importance of multiple languages. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking English now. We all love speaking English, but it's important mm -hmm. to open up to multiplicity of languages mm -hmm. and to invite Adonis, who is a French citizen, yeah. and as we heard, one of the greatest living poets in the Arab language, to actually read this collection, mm -hmm. engage with him. Third example, and I will end here. We are all here invited from between the 21st of March and the 21st of September to the medieval Louvre, the oldest part of the Louvre. We've mm -hmm. invited 104 poets from all around oh. the world, including the great Nunjum al Hanem we heard earlier today, to write a poem in the Louvre, on the Louvre. And they have, it's a book that's coming out in French in March, it's coming out in America in the New York Review of Books in October. But most importantly, they have mm. read these poems in their own language. These mm. poems they have mm. written on their work, from the Nobel laureate Jan Foss to Nujum al Hanem to Kim Gordon. And if you go to the medieval Louvre, between the 21st of March and the 21st of September, you will hear those 98 readings in Wolof, Arabic, Catalan, Chinese, French, mm -hmm. English, Italian, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, over 30 languages. And that is a direct example. Mm. You go deep into the origin of the mm. museum. It's a highly contemporary, all this is creation, and it's a reading of the collection. As Cézanne famously said, the Louvre is the book in which we learn how to read. Question of legibility and experience do not have to be disconnected. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much. That's brilliant. I also love that you're doing it in the medieval galleries, which, by the way, were as transnational as we are today. Globalization yeah. was not invented in 1989. So um, thank you for that. Uh, Richard, I think you have the... Thank you, Mingwei. Um, Pascal, we are so mm -hmm. honored to have you back in Abu Dhabi. Um, you recently did a brilliant show at the uh, uh, Cultural Foundation here with our dear colleague Rim Fada. Uh, and uh, we're always very interested in how you disrupt the museum space and introduce ideas of play and again cacophony, how you make us see the objects and detritus of our everyday world in these new contexts in, in spaces that um, of course, you not only work inside the galleries you're given, you also permeate um, outside. Um, you often work in playgrounds and um, the outside of museums or on their facades. You, you, um, uh, you, you kind of pollute our museums with uh, uh, the, the, the purity, the so-called purity of our museums with, with the everyday, with the everyday life. Um, so. Uh, we are excited to hear about your project here in Abu Dhabi. S'il te plaît. And for those who would like, you have French on channel two. Tu peux jouer le. Je sais pas comment ça marche. Je pas briefé. Merci beaucoup. Bienvenue dans dans ces lieux somptueux. Et euh, il s'agit d'aujourd'hui de parler du temps. Et moi, je vais essayer de raconter une histoire, comment j'entends le temps. Imaginons que le temps n'existait pas. Ça dit, c'est quoi le temps On ne peut pas parler du temps. Qu'est-ce qu'il y avait avant le, avant le temps D'où vient le temps mmh. Et nous, Je pense que mmh. chacun de nous à son propre temps. Depuis l'invention de l'horloge, on pense avoir maîtrisé le temps. Mais en fait, le temps, c'est une idée. Le temps n'existe pas. Il est infini. <rire> euh, si on regarde le temps comme un outil, par exemple comme une craie, un crayon, on peut en faire ce qu'on en veut. On peut dessiner un rond avec le temps. 
on peut raconter une poésie, une beauté avec le temps. Donc nous faisons du temps notre outil infini de possibilités. Rentrer dans un musée, c'est d'abord se dire que le musée n'existe pas. Je m'excuse, vous êtes des conservateurs du néant. Puisque en tant que sujet, individu, nous aspirons à bousculer les limites, à aller un peu plus loin. C'est comme ça que nous sommes en tant que sujet. Cela s'impose à nous en tant que sujet. Euh, si le temps intervient, c'est peut-être pour justifier nos efforts. C'est peut-être pour quantifier nos, nos productions, mmh. donner un sens à nos non-sens. Parce qu'en fait, à un moment donné, le temps n'apparaît qu'au moment où on a en face peut-être un chaos. Et lorsqu'on parle du chaos, c'est parce qu'il y a un désordre. C'est comme parler du bonheur. Normalement, dans le bonheur, c'est là, le malheur réside dans le bonheur, par exemple. Comme le temps réside dans l'infini. Le temps n'apparaît qu'au moment où il y a un crash. D'où il y a l'urgence. L'urgence de décider des décisions. Euh, dans le temps outil, le temps exploration. Euh, un musée n'est pas un lieu, s'il existait, parce que le musée pourrait être n'importe quoi, l'absolu. Donc ça dépend de ce que nous voulons constituer comme étant déterminant de notre existence. Mais il faut prendre conscience du fait que l'on existe déjà. Mais comment on existe C'est à chacun, à un moment donné, de déterminer les éléments de son constituant. Ce sujet du temps, il est intéressant parce que c'est comme un jouet, c'est comme une espèce de, de pâte à modeler. On peut faire des carrés, on peut fabriquer ce qu'on en veut, on peut faire des menus de restaurants, on peut, on peut créer des, on peut créer des, des intérêts. En ce moment-là, le temps devient un temps élastique, un temps élastique. Et qui dit temps élastique pourrait dire aussi temps plastique. Mm. Dont le temps d'une conséquence, le temps d'innovation et le temps plastique, c'est-à-dire le temps de, de constat. Bon. Lorsque je suis invité par ceux qui pensent que le musée existe, je dois considérer leur invention. Je ne rentre pas au musée parce qu'il est sacré. C'est parce que je dois vivre avec des humains. Et eux, ils ont leur plaisir, je dois partager leur plaisir. Pour moi, le musée n'est pas de l'absolu dans mon quotidien. C'est un outil de travail comme le temps aussi. Et là, je dois devoir, à un moment précis, déterminer ce que je vais mettre dans ce temps d'invitation. Vous voyez que dans le temps, il y a le temps aussi de l'invitation. Il y a le temps de l'urgence. J'ai parlé du temps est est élastique. Il y a le temps intellectuel, le temps de la pensée, le temps de la réflexion, mm -hmm. le temps de la décision. Mais je me concerne, je me con, je, ce qui me concerne élément, c'est le temps du discernement aujourd'hui. Le temps du discernement. Face à ce que nous vivons, puisque nous vivons tous les mêmes choses. C'est vrai, on a parfois l'impression que nous sommes chacun le centre du temps. On ignore que chaque personne est au centre. Nous ne sommes qu'une particule des centres. Et mon exploration dans les lieux, de, dans les lieux publics, dans les parcs, c'est des occasions qu'on me donne, parce que le monde est gentil avec moi, il me donne des opportunités. Et quand je reçois une opportunité, je transfère l'opportunité à ceux qui viennent me regarder. Mmh. Mmh. Euh, parce que, eh bien, évidemment, j'accepte aussi les, les définitions qu'on fait de moi. Pour beaucoup, je suis un artiste, mais je n'en suis pas un. Ça ne m'intéresse pas d'être un artiste, par exemple. Mais je, je suis. Mais j'accepte qu'on m'appelle artiste parce qu'il faut être gentil avec ceux qui pensent que je suis artiste. 
C'est eux qui déterminent que j'en suis un. <rire> Vous voyez, donc le temps, euh, alors, tout le monde devient donc comme une espèce de tube à essai, comme un élément, un outil d'exploration, de, de, un outil de réflexion. Là, nous sommes dans un atelier de réflexion. C'est-à-dire que tous ceux qui nous écoutent, ils font partie de notre travail. Mais le hasard a voulu que nous soyons au centre de la conversation. Mais là où ils sont, ils sont au centre de l'audition. Parce que le silence aussi, c'est la parole. Alors, l'exposition que j'ai faite ici il y a, un an, il y a deux ans, euh, j'avais décidé de l'appeler « Lobby Lobby ». Et c'est curieux que ça rentre en connexion avec euh, cette thématique, parce que le lobby, c'est une expression d'une langue africaine qui veut dire qui réunit le temps présent dans le temps ancien et le temps futur. Ça dit qu'aujourd'hui, c'est hier, demain, c'est aujourd'hui. Lobby, lobby. Ça dit que le temps dynamique est devenu le, mmh. temps, le, temps, le temps présent. Ça dit en termes de conjugaison, on dira le passé, le futur et au présent. Euh, et tout ça, il faut trouver un ordre dans tout ça, au travers de nos passions. Il y a des passions collectives, c'est-à-dire les passions qui engagent les États, des familles, des régions géopolitiques, des régions territoriales, des raisons territoriales. Mais dans tout ça, il y a des passions individuelles que parfois nous ignorons. Ça fait sept minutes euh, Trois minutes. Non, cinq minutes. J'ai encore du temps un minute plus. Voilà. <rire> euh, donc on va conclure qu'en fait, dans mon âme, j'essaie d'être en relation avec mon esprit. Parce que mon temps n'est pas un temps singulier, c'est un temps pluriel. Pourquoi il est pluriel Parce que dans mon moi, j'ai beaucoup de temps. Et ces temps-là, c'est les compositions de tous les autres temps qui me regardent. Tous les yeux qui me regardent impriment dans mon moi beaucoup d'autres temps. Donc ce que je produis... J'imagine, c'est le rêve d'un temps partagé. Je ne suis qu'un passeur d'une conception globale que j'ignore parfois. Merci. Thank you. Fantastic. Merci. Merci beaucoup. So, Donatien and Richard, I think what, I, what occurs to me listening to Mingwei and, and, and Pascal so brilliantly is all these changes, Donatien, that you're talking about, all these changes, Richard, that you have also implemented in your 16-year tenure at the Guggenheim, we're responding. We have to respond to these new practices. It's not that we're just inviting Mingwei and have to make a space for him to do his thing. We have to change our thinking in response to the intelligence that you're bringing to us and the practice that you're changing for all of us. Um, do you agree with that, Richard? Partly, I think uh, the courage that museum people have to have is the courage that artists give them. Yeah. So for me, no matter what was happening, the most important thing was really what the artist wanted, even if I didn't agree, but I felt that that was our obligation as cultural st stewards to let the artist move forward. Mm -hmm. It was painful. It is painful. <laughs> Uh, so, it may be painful, but it brings a lot of joy. That, that said, I'm, I'm at a different position because, you know, Musée d'Orsay stopped collecting in 1914, Louvre stops collecting in 1948, a little bit later now with the new department, it's Musée d'Orsay and it's Pompidou. So technically, I have no professional duty towards you. <laughs> None. <laughs> that said, and that's why I said you are our first audience, because yeah. I and everyone working mm -hmm. in the museum has an immense professional duty mm -hmm. towards the audience, mm -hmm. towards the audience members, towards our many constituencies. And you are our first audience. You feel the things, you sense the things, you see things we would never see, like you did. I mean, everything mm -hmm. you said, Pascal, or the wonderful story you said, it's uh, deeply embedded, and both your words could be taken as allegories to every single one of us experiencing works mm -hmm. of art at Louvre Abu Dhabi here, at the Louvre in Paris, and in all of the world's museums. Mm -hmm. And that is really what we are looking for with artists. Mm -hmm. We want to be as easy for you as we can be. And for us to be guided by you, and to give us the tremor of the experience mm -hmm. that will be 
the, the experience of the audience of tomorrow, which we are also, because we're in this, because we love it. Mm -hmm. I would totally agree with you as a curator. I often tell younger curators working with me that it's not only the first audience, but it really is our most important audience. What I care for, even with all my books and writing and scholarship, is actually if an exhibition I put forward touches an artist, because you are the laboratory of our future. If an artist or an idea or an exhibition thesis hasn't changed your mind in some way or hasn't, you know, kind of... Uh, touch the molecules in your brain in a way that make you think differently, um, I failed. Um, because you, the artists, are the ones who are creating the culture forward. Can Another thing that I think is interesting today is that the bridge between artists and scholars doesn't exist anymore. Mm. You know, you are researchers in your own ways. The great Kader Atiyah, who's speaking a bit later, who's artist in residence at the Louvre from now on for 18 months, he's a scholar, he's a thinker. Yeah. as well as a visual artist. Mm -hmm. There are many scholars who actually make, produce creative work. Look at Richard and Alexandra's performance here today. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it is. There are bridges. There's research, different forms of research, poetic research, formal right. research, right? And, and ways of experiencing and expanding our knowledge. Oh, je ne pense pas qu'il faille donner un rôle à un corps. Euh, nous, nous sommes tous des créateurs. Nous sommes tous des créateurs, dans la culture, ce n'est pas, pas l'apanage de, de soi-disant artistes. Dans ce cas, nous sommes tous des artistes. Parce que nous, nous avons, pour, on va dire, pour mission, en tant qu'existants, de proposer. Et dans tout ce qu'on fait chaque fois, ben, si on met de l'intérêt, de, de, de la détermination, à l'arrivée, on participe tous à nos identités, à notre, à notre, à notre façon de vivre. Donc, le plus important, c'est d'être ouvert, d'être attentif oui. et euh, à, à ce qu'on fait tous les jours à la maison, quel qu'en soit l'étrange d'âge. Parce que euh, c'est pour ça, d'ailleurs, je ne je, mm -hmm. je suis pas d'accord qu'on m'appelle artiste parce que j'ai l'impression que j'ai une mission de sauver le monde. Et voilà, je ne crée pas de la culture. Peut-être j'en consomme. Mais of ritual, which is your art form. Oh, I, I just think that every museum is a living organism that you as a curator, artist and visitors, we all are little cells that makes this living organism grow mm -hmm. in front of us and it's our future that we are creating together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Merci, thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo.